clean up miscellany. Um, and so I'm going to drop some miscellany on you before I go into the uh, serious consideration of differential equations. And then I want to do some serious, serious consideration of differential equations maybe after that. Um, the, the miscellany is this. this. Here's an idea due to Philippe Mannery, who always has ideas, many of which work. Um, this idea is the following. Take anything that you want, so maybe an oscillator. Oh, right, it's the wrong button. Well, actually, anything that you want, so let's just make it a black box. And then we do the following thing to it. Um, well, we all know how to do uh, ring modulation now. You, you multiply by a, by a sinusoidal oscillator, say, although it could be any oscillator that you want. The result is always uh, smaller in absolute value than the thing that you put in because the sinusoid, at least if it's normalized, goes from minus one to one. So out comes a signal and it's, you know, it's got probably less power than the signal that goes in and, and it's got, uh, anyway, it's maximum, it's peak, can't be any, any greater than the signal that goes in. So why don't you then make a feedback loop out of this by doing the following. Take this thing and multiply it by any gain that you want less than one and then add that right back in again. Now what that should do is the following. Suppose you put a sinusoid in whose spectrum would look like peak, right? So then what comes out of the, um, out of the modulation process is two peaks like this. And then if you then, well, all right, so an equivalent network to this, since feedback is, as far as I know, is always equivalent to an, um, a non-feedback circuit, which you make just by unwrapping it. Is, is, so the, the equivalent thing that you could do is this. Uh, times, I'm just going to uh, simplify it a little bit. Dot, dot, dot. And then we're going to have sinusoid, and I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to not put the Gs in because we can make the Gs be the, be the amplitude of the sinusoid if you want. So here is the hall of mirrors um, uh, equivalent of this, uh, uh, of this feedback network described as a non-feedback network. Uh, this, by the way, I, looks like a letter A, but I mean, mean times here. <laughs> Multiply, please. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, what? Oh, right. Now, the next thing is uh, it, each each of these stages is is lower in amplitude than the previous one. But in fact, you can even uh, talk analytically about which what these stages do. Because if this is peak number one, if this is stage number one here, then here's stage number two. And stage number three is going to be stage number two split up like this. Three, but then also three here, and three here. Um, specifically, this would be a quarter, a half, and a quarter. That uh, looks like we're going to see the, that stupid triangle again, right? Because the next one is now going to be an eighth. Um, what, let's see, one quarter plus a half is three quarters. No, this is height one, and this is height 0.75, and so on. Anyway, so on like that. Basically, what's going to happen is as it gets wider and wider and wider, you, oops, you will eventually get some kind of spectrum that looks something like this. Well, I went home after Philippe said, could you do this? Okay, so, so it's, uh, he proposes this as, as an alternative to FM. Rather than do FM, why don't you just do AM and then put the a AM, which is this, and do it in a feedback loop. And in fact, you can compute what the spectral envelope would be. And it would be, it's, the truth is amazing. You get a falling exponential envelope on both sides. <laughs> and the speed of decay of the following exponential turns out to depend on the feedback coefficient G. So that if G is one, it's flat. And in fact, if G is 1, right when this thing hits phase, right when this thing hits the value 1, which is the phase of 0, uh, suddenly the thing gives you an infinitely tall peak. And in fact, if you, if you uh, looked at what happened, if you just assume that there's no drop-off at all in the spectrum, that's a, that's a pulse train. And so, you know, that's a, an infinitely narrow but infinitely high peak. Right? It's, it's a pulse with an, with an area of 1 but, but, no, but a 0 bandwidth. Okay, so, so this is g, g equals 1, and this is a real G. We'll call it G less than 1. 
And so he actually has re reinvented in one stroke the uh, phase-aligned formant generator, <laughs> which is this thing which you get uh, according, well, after three pages of math, you do some tricky trick of wave shaping and you get exactly the same spectrum out, uh, which is a thing I wrote up in 92 or 93 and got a patent on and everything. Uh, and there it is. All you have to do is just make this feedback loop. While we're at it, um, interestingly enough, uh, I had also heard many, many years ago, and so this is just hearsay. Okay, let's save this and do a save as. Uh, wish there were. There it is. I can say Shift Control S. Okay. So here's the. Uh, There, got it. All right. Um, here's the thing that John Chowning once told me. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see. FM network, how do you do this? You make an oscillator. This is Chowning language, I think. And, and take that oscillator and, of course, multiply it by a gain, but I'm going to ignore that and just assume that the gain is part of the oscillator and put that in the frequency input of another oscillator. And um, not even bother talking about amplitudes here. Okay, and this is now, there's FM. Why, uh, you can talk about doing the same thing. You can do this. And then you get FM feeding back instead of AM feeding back. And again, uh, you can do this with, actually, I think you can do this with any gain that you please, even gains larger than one, because this thing, you're, you're not, um, what, what comes out of here is not, uh, doesn't grow with what goes in. What goes in is a frequency and what comes out is, a, is an amplitude. So you can throw in as high a frequency as you want going back. So you just get a completely free reign as to what kind of gain you want. Um, all right, and in that case, you could do this. You could take the oscillator and even forget about the other oscillator and just do this. So now you've got an oscillator. Well, maybe it has a. Uh, maybe you're going to add a constant to the frequency so that there will be a center frequency for FM. But at any rate, um, uh, at any rate, just take the output and feed it back into the input. Then what would happen? And Chowning told me, although I did not check, that the spectrum of this has an interesting property that, that the original spectrum doesn't, which is that it is exactly band limited. <laughs> it actually cuts off. You know, so all of these other techniques that I was telling you, including the puff, um, the phase line format, have, uh, have infinite bandwidth. And you deal with that simply by ha giving it a high enough sample rate and not, and not giving it such a crazy index of modulation so that uh, the foldover is at least reasonably controlled. Well, um, this jumped into my head in the context of this course. Uh, and I could be misquoting, or I could be misremembering. Uh, but this is a claim uh, that uh, that people at Stanford had uh, that they uh, that they were mm, not making noise about because they were planning to patent it, and then I never heard again about this thing, <laughs> which might mean that they discovered the fatal flaw in this whole idea. <laughs> and what is the fatal flaw? The fatal flaw is <laughs> that there's no space in this uh, analysis for a delay. The only, you know, in reality, if you want to do this feedback, you have to do it with a feed. Uh, you have to do it with a delay of a sample, I guess, if you're doing it digitally. If you're doing it the, the usual sampled way, anyhow. And my reason for bringing this up now is that it occurred to me as I was talking about or thinking about continuous time processes that we could actually do this now. And then I sat down and thought about: Can I actually do the math and verify that this thing gives you a spectrum that's band limited? And I was. It was ugly enough that I didn't even finish trying to figure it out. So I'm actually not sure what this thing would do if you actually did it. And it's only hearsay that this thing makes this magic band limited result. It, it was, you know, just John Chowning drawing it on a napkin for me one day. And I don't know if John even remembers about this. But that, if you could do that as a differential equation, might give you something interesting. So why, don't, why doesn't somebody who isn't me go investigate that? Uh, and the way to do it is not to try to, to write out the equations which are intractable, but to uh, just make it and see what the spectrum of this thing actually is. And make it with a delay. Make it without a delay. Oh. That's to say, try to implement 
the thing as a oh this what am I saying this is not this is this is a delay zero network and this is the kind of delay zero network that um, all right so a thing I did not tell you a week ago because I wasn't thinking about it but uh, but which is probably important. There are actually three different ways of thinking about feedback circuits. Uh, one is the digital, the sampled way in which it, all feedback paths have at least one sample of delay. Another, the second way that I've been talking about and which I will now resume talking about is, is modeling things using differential equations. And that is all right as long, or rather you can use that to model a, a situation like this as long as the output here is saying. As long as the output isn't a function of the input, as long as the output, as long as the derivative of the output is, is a function of the input, in other words, as long as the input controls the rate of change of the output in some way, then you can write this down as a differential equation. This, but this thing as I've described it, doesn't have any capacitors in it, if you like. Is that really true? Well, going back to Philippe's example of ring modulation, that really does not have any capacitance in it. Here, there's a mem there is memory of a phase here, so there might actually be some way that you would think of this as a differential equation. But I believe that the way to set this up is as an algebraic equation. In other words, what this is saying is that the input is exactly equal to the output. In other words, whatever the, f the whatever the internal phase is here, which is there's an internal phase which is going as a sawtooth regardless of everything else. So it's so it's essentially independent of what's going on. And now what we're saying here is actually that. Uh, if there's a gain here, which I'll throw in now at last, what we're saying now is that the, what are we saying? Oh, gosh. You know what? I think I'm lying to you. <laughs> I think I'm lying. I think this is a differential equation because what, what happens here is that uh, the, this, this being the frequency here is controlling the rate of change of the output. So in fact, this is a differential equation. So you can do this with what I'm going to show you later in this uh, session. Although I'm not sure I'm going to take the time to do it because I'm afraid of blowing us up. Um, all right, so, uh, so th this could be described as a differential equation, but going back to the Philippe example, the Philippe example is this. Uh, take, take an input, whatever you want, and multiply it by a sinusoid and then um, put that in a feedback loop with a gain. That, uh, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no rate of change expressed in this, in this feedback loop. This is actually algebraic. This is actually making a statement that this is algebra algebraically related to that because, in fact, it's equal to g times it. And no, no derivatives anywhere here. There's just multipliers. So this is, this is an algebraic one if you like. This is, I guess this is described as a differential equation. And then the third thing is what we saw earlier, which was sampled uh, delay networks. So actually, now that I say that, um, I can't think of any other interesting examples of, of just a pure no delay and no time dependence network. This is the only example I can think of right now that, that has come up, at least, at least in this context. Okay, so having said that, this would, be, this would be set up as a set of differential equations, write those out and, and use the following technique to solve them. And now I have to tell you a little bit about the, well I don't really have to, but it would be a good thing if I told you a little bit about the yoga of solving differential equations so that you can have some idea of what's going on. Uh, I, I, I broached this subject last time, but I didn't broach it terribly well, so maybe I should go on and try to broach it a little bit better. Um, so here's the broaching. Um, Let's see, let's save this and make a new page. Save and save as, and we'll save number three. And then we'll say select, no, select it all. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Come on, oh, ridiculous, open recent. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so I was gonna try to select all, good. There it is. All right, so differential equations. Uh, the, the simplest possible differential equation you could imagine is uh, just integrating a function. And integrating a function looks something like this. Uh, in fact, just for fun, I'll do it with a sinusoid. Not for fun, but because this will show you how this and sampling theory are related. 
So there's a, there's a sinusoid. Now what we want to do is we want to integrate it. What that means is that um, we want to start at zero, although we get to choose to start at any point that we want, but we'll start at zero. That's called the initial condition. And then um, at any given instant in time, such as this one right here, we want it to be the case that the made a bad choice. That's all right. We want it to be the case that the, uh, I'm sorry. All right, now how am I going to rescue this drawing? This is not aligned with that. So. All right. <laughs> now I can draw it. Okay, so what's going to happen here is, uh, what we want in the bottom is the cumulative area of what's at the top. So uh, this stuff here, whatever this area is, is going to be the height of this function here. And I'll just let the cat out of the bag. The function is going to be going up as long as the thing is positive, but here where the thing turns negative, suddenly now we're starting to subtract from this so that it starts going back down. In fact, it goes down and it hits zero again right here. And the deal is that the slope at any point of this function is equal to the value of that function. That's what integration means. Or to put it another way, if we are, um, if we are cumulatively adding up all the sand under this sand pile, then the uh, amount of sand, the rate of change at which we're adding sand here is equal to this height. And that's, that sounds simple. You can say it in a way that makes it seem like that simple. That's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And you will understand it, or believe you understand it now, and then you will wake up tomorrow and not understand why this is true, and that will be normal. Um, but, it, but it's true. Okay, so the, so the rate of change of this thing is equal to that thing. And that's, that's the sim simplest imaginable kind of differential equation. Um, differential equation just means a thing that, in which you specify somebody's rate of change, and then you want to know what it actually is. All right. Now, um, all right, now my point in doing this is the following. We could... Uh, we could try to do this numerically. That's to say we could try to write a program in which we don't know this thing is a mathematical formula, for instance. We might just have it as inputs coming off of a thermometer or even a microphone. And, and then we would want to ca carry out the same kind of operation and, and ask what the, what the integral of that thing has been over time. And um, a way to do that is just take the input at various moments in time find out what it is, and then, and then in a finite step process, in a process of finite steps, this is, this is a continuous time process, but in, a, but in a finite process, you would say, at any given point, we will just um, proceed to the next point in time, I'll exaggerate, by, um, by looking at th the value of the function at this point in time and calling that the slope. So the slope is zero there, and then suppose we wait until we get to this point here. So then we say, oh, the slope is going to be 1 now, so we'll go up to, I don't know what, what well, we go up to whatever the step is. I don't know what this frequency is, so I don't know what the step size is. Then it says, ah, the slope is 0. So it goes 0. And then we'll say, ah, the slope is minus 1. And then we go like that. And so then we find this thing, which is an approximation of that. And notice that it's kind of ugly. Uh, it's not as ugly as you can make it. Uh, there are other situations, for instance, when we were talking about circular flows, where if you did this um, simple method of integration, the thing would actually spiral out of control. In other words, you can, uh, because of the symmetry here, this thing actually behaves itself, at least in the longer term. But nobody said it had to. It did, it did not have to. And then, uh, of, co of course, you say, well, this is a horrible approximation, and if you played this in a speaker, it wouldn't sound anything like this nice sinusoid. This, by the way, is a sinusoid with a different phase, and... And a DC offset because I goofed it up. Um, uh, but of course, you could make it a little bit better because you could, uh, you could, uh, sorry, you could reduce the time step. Now, suppose you reduce the time step in half, then the slope would still be zero, but it would only be zero for half as long, and then the slope would be one over the square root of two here, yeah, and then one, and then one over the square root of two. I'm not drawing it to scale, and then zero, and then minus one of the square root of two, and then minus one, and then minus one of the square root of two, and then zero. 
that's a problem. And then you get, oh, look, it almost looks like a sinusoid. No. Well, okay, how much closer to a sinusoid is this than that? You can actually uh, figure that out quantitatively. And, and what people say is, if you, have this, if you divide the step size by two, the mean error, the average error goes down by four, by a factor of four. Uh, in other words, the error is of the order of, of h squared if h is the size of the step. And that's, um, yeah, all right, I won't go any further into that than to, to, than to just say that. Now, um, are you interpolating between the values? Am I interpolating between, oh, should I, oh, right. Or, like, yeah, could you? Could you or interpolate? You rather, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that leads to the next thing that I should tell you, which is, yeah, you could interpolate between the values. And, <laughs> and then what you get is this. Um, then what you get is uh, what I'm going to. Okay, let's go back to let's go back to this step size. So the, so the step size here is one quarter cycle. So instead, so we'll make the step size a quarter cycle here. But the slope, instead of being zero, will be uh, a half times zero plus a half times one. Sorry. Okay. Right. In other words, um, this. Uh, in other words, rather than approximating this thing, let me go back. What's the slope of this thing? The slope of that thing is nothing, and then one, and then nothing, and then minus one. So what if instead of doing that, we integrated a function, which we could do analytically, whose slope was a linearly interpolated version of that? Whoops, wait, I'm not doing this very right. Oh yeah, I am doing this right. No, I'm not. What am I doing wrong? I'm gonna linear interpolate between there and there, then between there and there, ah, got it, okay. Okay, very badly, try it again. Okay, interpolate between zero and one, interpolate between one and zero, interpolate between zero and minus one, interpolate between minus one and one. Then the integral of that, you do this analytically, the integral of this thing is a parabola. The integral of this is another parabola. <laughs> well, I don't have. Hey, what's this thing doing to me? Oh, right, wrong button. Somehow I always confuse the arrow and the S key. Sorry, I have to move my axis down because I messed up. Okay, so the next one is going to be th the same parabola essentially but backwards. So it's going to look like this. And the next one's going to be another piece of a parabola. The next one's going to be another piece of a parabola. And suddenly it's looking uh, a little smoother than this even and a little bit more like that. By the way, this, this should be the scaled like that, which it's not. So sorry that my scale has been messing up. All, the, all right? And this is, um, what this is, Let's see. What you would call this is let me just let me just tell you what this is known as. This is called the trapezoid rule, because what we're doing is we're integrating a. Uh, this is a spe This is, looks funny because it looks like the triangle rule, but in general, the function. Uh, in general, two points of a function would then cause us to linearly interpolate like that, and that would be a trapezoid. So trapezoid rule, and the trapezoid rule. Well, it approximates the function a great deal better. It, 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 this approximation uh, is good to roughly one over h. Sorry, this sorry. Uh, this approximation is good to order h if h is the uh, step size. So I'm going to I'm going to make a. So this is the step size here. Uh, so, uh, so the error here, in other words, this is a bad approximation of the sinusoid because it can, its, its error can reach up to the value h. This error is, uh, on, is at least proportional to h squared. It's, it's something h, it's probably 2h squared, but anyway, it's, it's, it goes as h squared. In other words, as I, drop the, um, as I drop the step size down, this thing approaches the sinusoid that we're approximating better and better at a faster rate than this does. Okay. And as a result, this thing, which is its integral, ends up being uh, better uh, to order h cubed. 
because each of these h squared errors then gets multiplied by another h here. In other words, the error here is a little crescent here. No, not, not that crescent. The crescent the other way. It's a little crescent here whose height is about h squared and whose, whose length is h. And so the error here is on the order of h cubed. That's, uh, you know, I'm oversimplifying a lot of stuff here. but And that's the error per step, by the way. It still accumulates. Okay. Um, this is called a higher order method. This is a second order method. And, um, and in general, you can do all this. You, you, can, you can do this all week. And uh, in particular, well, you got a choice now. You can either uh, study this for a month or two, which I've done, or you can just uh, reach for Rungakutta, which is a fourth order general purpose. I don't, have, I don't want to think about this uh, differential equation solver. Why don't you just use 50th order or something like that? Uh, the answer is that the order, by the way, what, what do I mean that by the order? This is a second order uh, method and this is a first order method. So the order, roughly speaking, is, how, is what degree of polynomial am I willing to approximate the function with? Or how many points of interpolation am I going to apply in order to try to, to fit the polynomial very, uh, to fit the original function very well? Um, there's, a, there's a thing that happens, though, which is that even though as the step size goes down, the rate at which the, um, uh, the, rate at which the behavior improves goes up. What am I saying? Let, let, me, let me make a fake graph that will show you what I'm trying to talk about. Um, so I'm going to save this. Sorry, I, I really i am sort of turning into a math prof here, which is silly. Because that's not really what you're paying for. Um, so here, here's what here's what actually happens, though. Um, the deal is, as your as h let's see how we're, as one over h goes up. In other words, as the number of steps goes up. So one over h is big if the step size is little. In other words, if, if the step size is 100, h is 100. So, the, so h is the, this is the number of steps per unit that we make. Yeah, or it's the amount of work that we put in, or the amount of computation that we, that we throw at the problem. Well, OK, so a first order method goes down as uh, the error goes down roughly as 1 over x. The, sorry. Oh, oh, so I'm going to call this, uh, how about work? Work is 1 over h. So the, uh, so the first order method goes down as one over work if you um, if you multiply again by the number of steps that you had to make. Um, the second order method goes down as one over w squared, but starts off higher. And the fourth order method does something similar. So uh, first, okay, order one, two, and four. So in fact, at any given, um, at any given step size, uh, one of these orders is going to be best, but it's not the case that the higher the order is, the better you're going to get with, with a fixed step size. What is true is that um, as the order goes up, the speed at which it then decreases as you increase the step size goes up. And this is why you, you don't just say 50th order or something like that. You just choose an order. And why do people choose four? Just because that seems to, it seems frequently to be a good choice. And that's just kind of a, a, a hand-waving way of talking about what's going on. All right, um, save this, and yeah, now I can move to reality here, which is making, uh, actually solving differential equations. So the, my purpose in doing all this was to be able to do the Moog filter and the uh, Lorentz attractor. And so let's go get the Moog filter and the Lorentz attractor out. Uh, the Moog, uh, okay, and to do this, uh, this, this stuff should be on your um, on the website if you're downloading the files. And in fact, I put it up last week because I was intending to talk about it last week and never never had time. But I have now moved it to this week. So if you're looking for it now, look under eight, not under seven. And what you get is all this stuff. And I actually went ahead and took uh, took the risk of compiling it for Macintosh. So you get this thing. Oh, right, OK. Oh, dear. There's something bad. 
Everything is compiled except the Runga Kutta object itself. So you might have to <laughs> you might have to compile something. Sorry. Okay. Yep. That's what it is. All right. So so if one of you wants it and doesn't can't can't run on your Macintosh, tell me and I'll try to download it to I'll, I'll copy it to some Mac somewhere and co compile it. I seem to have forgotten. All right. So uh, what you do is the following. Let's go for Rungakuta help. Here's a helpful hint for those of you who are interested in, in writing objects for PD. Uh, write a little test patch and make that be your help patch. And then when you forget to document your thing, at least, <laughs> at least you'll have your little test patch to, go, to fall back on as a help patch. So my test patch is called Rungakota help, even though it really should be called Rungakota test. All right? And I did throw some arguments in because I'm trying to be on my best behavior here because I'm in public. Right? So, um, so what's going on is this. Uh, there is an object called Runkakuta, and what you give it is two things. You give it the object that you're going to load, which is the definition of the differential equation, and you give it a thing which is 1 over h, which I should explain. Yeah, which I will try to explain right now. Um, that's the number of steps that it takes per sample. And the, the minimum that it was willing to do is one. In other words, it'll do one step of Runga-Kutta integration per sample. But you can ask it to do two, four, or five, or whatever number you want that's, uh, that's an integer that's greater than zero. And the, uh, uh, the, the punchline is that the more you do, the, the happier, or the more accurate the result is that it gives you. And I can actually demonstrate that with the Moog filter and, and show, you, show you that the thing actually produces believable results. Is there a downside? Oh, is there a downside? Just computation. And uh, what's the computational cost of this? The Runga-Kutta being a fourth order method has to compute four points of whatever function it is that you specified. Mm -hmm. And that is usually in real situations the most expensive part of integrating a differential equation is just calling the function that you define the, the differential equation with. So at this point I should get the function out so you can see it. Um, in fact, I already tried to talk about this last time, but uh, uh, didn't get very far. So let's see, Moog filter dot C. So here's the Moog filter function. And the deal was that you had to write a function called uh, Runge-Kutta derivative, and you had to give it, uh, the function has to compute a result given the state and the parameters. The state is the, all right, so now I have to go back to the picture again. Um, oof, wrong picture though. I have to go back. Gosh, wait a second. Yeah, I think it's better if I just go back. Okay, so I'm going to save this, and then I'm going to open recent, and go back one step. Yeah. Okay. So here, um, this this particular problem, which is integrating this sinusoid, is a special case of a differential equation, um, because what you, the slope that, uh, in other words, the speed at which this thing changes depends only on the input and not upon itself. But in general, in a differential equation, how fast we're changing can depend on our inputs, which in, which in the language of Moog filter anyway, is, is the parameters of the filter in some way. So these are parameters going in. And then there's the Moog filter's own capacitors, capacitor charges, which are the things that are varying in time. And what happens depends not only on the inputs to the filter, but it also depends on the charge of the capacitors themselves because they discharge into each other in complicated ways. Right? So what you have to, so if, if you like, what's, what's, uh, what's going to vary in time is, is four numbers, which are the charges and the four capacitors in the Moog filter, the four interesting capacitors anyway. And, um, and then what, what's going to come in from the outside world is three things. So the Moog filter has two things that really are genuinely parameters, you can think of them that way, which are the cutoff frequency and the resonance. And again, I'll just confuse you by saying that the cutoff frequency 
is what one calls the resonant frequency in other filter designs, but it, in the Moog filter it's called the cutoff frequency, even though it's sometimes the pitch that you hear. And then the resonance is, is actually the sharpness, it's usually called Q. Right? Um, okay, so the inputs are the reson resonance and, sorry, cutoff and resonance, but also uh, the, the th a third parameter is the actual signal that's going into the filter that you're filtering. So there are three of them. So there are four. There are four of the four of these things. Four outputs, which are capacitive charges, and three inputs, which are the signal inputs to the filter. All right. Uh, okay. So now go back here. Uh, right. So what you have to do is you have to give it a function, Runge cut a derivative, which gives you a result, which is the derivative, the the, the speed at which the output should change given where the outputs now are, which is the state, and given the parameters. And then, you, and then here are the four equations which correspond to the mode filter, and then I have to hand wave a little bit because I don't want to, uh, neither do I want to, nor am I sure I can tell you, uh, tell you exactly why these equations are, or what they are. They work. And, and what they are is, is, the, is the set of four low-pass filters with the overall feedback going, connecting all the four low-pass filters. And then there was this thing about that being the, the moment where the phase became one over, uh, became 180 degrees, that becomes the frequency at which the thing rings, but which is called the cutoff frequency, et cetera. Okay. So that's all from last time. All right. So uh, here, while we're, uh, while we're just looking at the patch, the deal is this, uh, this object, Moog filter, uh, sorry, Runga Kutta, uh, picks up the definition of the um, of the differential equations, which, which define what we're going to be, which is a Moog filter. So the, Moog, so the reason it's a Moog filter is because I fed it the Moog filter's worth of differential equations. And since I asked Runge Kutta to pick this thing up, it does so and it becomes a Moog filter. And furthermore, the thing knows how many inputs and how many outputs it has to have because by, just by a convention that I made up purely for this purpose, uh, in this thing you just, uh, decl you just define integers <laughs> that PD can look at, which, uh, which tell it how many inputs and outputs you should have. And this is a, um, it struck me as being a better way to, uh, better design to have the, this thing know how many inputs and outputs and tell PD in a very clear way what the number of inputs and outputs would be, rather than me have to tell PD what it was and then if it didn't match, you would crash. Seems like maybe it's better to, I mean, still, if you don't match it, it's gonna crash, but at least here it's all in one place that you can see whether it matches or not. Okay, so the thing sprouts inlets and outlets depending on what you give it there. And uh, yeah, and then finally there's this parameter which is just the number of steps per sample. Um, going back to the number of steps per sample, let me go back to the picture again. And quick comparison. Um, here, this sinusoid, the, the highest frequency at which we can represent the sinusoid Sorry, the lowest sample rate or the largest sample period at which we can represent the sinusoid is that for the sample period to be, um, for there to be two samples per period. So that this frequency is, um, is one half of the sample rate. That's the Nyquist. In other words, for this thing to be at the Nyquist, the sample rate would have to be uh, one half of the period, which is either the top lobe or the bottom lobe. And that's, even that's a, a corner, well, that's, that's jargon. That, even that's an extreme. You really can't push it there in reality. You, 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 you probably really shouldn't go above about two-thirds of Nyquist. So really, we should be doing everything at 64 kilohertz or higher, but no one seems to bother with that. So I'll continue not bothering with that. Um, all right. And, um, and here, what, we, what, what I did to get this kind of, kind of shaky integration out was use a step size which was precisely twice the, uh, sorry, which is one quarter the period of the sinusoid. So as a way of thinking, just, um, what's, the right, what's the right way to say this? Just sort of as, a, as an intuitive idea, describing the sinusoid really requires four points per cycle, so that you can see it go up, hit zero, go down, hit zero. And if, if, you, if you give it that lousy a description of what's going on, then you can get, when you're doing the linear method, about this good a result, and if you're doing the quadratic result, about the second order method, about this good a result. Uh, what do I, okay, I'm 
we're doing something wrong here. But anyway, uh, good enough. Um, what that's telling you is that um, you should be going at least the sample rate and perhaps about twice the sample rate to be able to integrate a high frequency sinusoid sampled. Rule of thumb. Um, so I'm thinking rule of thumb maybe about two, about two per is going to be a good default. Two, two points per sample. And that's very, very uh, sloppy. Uh, well, I, I didn't actually ever try to use Runga Kutta to integrate a sinusoid at Nyquist to see if it can do it. Um, could do that, but um, but anyway, uh, real it, it would differ depending on the actual situation, and I don't know if that's really the uh, that's really the thing that one should test it on, or if it's something else. All right. Um, and then what happens is, well, you just uh, you just run it and enjoy the result. So run it and run it and, and enjoy the result. Oh, right. Here's here's an input, um, and here's the output. Uh, let's see. To hear the output, one should. Oh, I see. I've I've already set the resonant frequency to something so that you'll hear a result. And now the the cutoff frequency does this. And the resonance does this. Let's see. Turn it down a little bit and make it more resonant. Whoa. Oh, I thought I was at A, but I was at A flat. Or sorry, at G. There we go. <laughs> All right. Now, a um, uh, thing I should explain here. Uh, in the resonant filter, the um, the amount of gain that you have to give it to feedback, that is to say to actually oscillate, is four. And I've scaled this thing, I just scaled the equations. Let's see if this is true. I scaled the equations so that um, oh, I'm sorry, I did it right here. <laughs> Duh, I'm dividing by 25 so that 100 gives us a value of 4. So this uh, this 100 is right at which the th right the point at which the thing should start oscillating. So let's turn this thing off and see if it oscillates. Nope. Oh yeah, just barely. Actually, it's probably decaying because it's it. If it were linear, it would be. Um, if it were linear, it would be just oscillating at this point. But there are cubic. Um, saturators in there that are causing the thing to gain, lose gain very slightly. So you actually have to push it a little bit higher, like 101, before it really oscillates robustly. There we go. And now we're, now what's happening is the thing is nominally unstable, but then it's pushing it up against the saturation function of the transistors, which is the usual cubic saturation function. And then if you push it harder, then it goes wildly unstable, so then you make the saturation work harder. And then it does that. And I have no idea whether that's correct behavior for a Moog filter or not. You will have to ask Tom Herb that because he's got a Moog filter somewhere and it might actually be working and he can actually... Oh, he would have to open the thing up because the knob, of course, only goes up to about four. <laughs> He'd have to open it up and figure out a way to make the knob go up to eight and then you would see if the thing actually went south. But I believe it will. I believe it'll as the, as the transistors start to saturate, they'll get more and more woolly-headed, and the thing will actually go slightly south in frequency. It's, it's a totally believable thing to have a circuit do. Uh, and just for, um, just for the enjoyment of it, um, going back to 79, uh, it does the correct thing when you try to filter something, which is it filters it okay until you ask it to oscillate at a different frequency from the frequency at which it wants to, <laughs> uh, at which it's being driven. And then there'll be a tug of war or a, a fight between who gets the frequency. And they both get it for a while, but the filter eventually wins. Actually, no, it's not true. And now uh, the other example that's useful is instead of Two octaves up. Let's uh, let's go down to the the octave of the filter. So 55. All 
right? So now we're playing A and we're filtering at G. And somewhere in here there's the place where it's going to fight. It's not the same not the same effect as we got when we forced when we did the synthetic filter that was uh, based on flow. That, uh, those those things were much more interesting sounding fights than this, but this is stuff that you can actually get on your Moog synthesizer. Let's see, what else should I say? The other thing is, yeah, extremes of resonance. And that's all stuff that you can pay money for. Yeah. <laughs> Um, now, uh, exploring the limits of how many steps per, well, of, of how hard you can, how hard you can uh, push this before you need more steps. Um, first off, let's, uh, let's set the oversampling just to one. Let's see if it still works, first off. So here's oversampling of one. Ooh. not expecting that. That's a difference tone. I'll bet you money if you compute that it's the frequency which is the difference between 57 and 55. Oh wait, that's 20. I'm sorry, this is the this is the resonant for never mind. That's that thing. Okay, so now let's turn this down. Okay, so everything is groovy. I'm going to turn it down here because I'm not sure what's going to happen to it. Uh, and now let's push up a little more. Wow. All right. Uh, this is working a little bit better than it should. Uh, which is to say, I think the last time I tried this, it didn't work as well. At some point, you hit a frequency that it just can't do. There. Ooh, listen to that. That is failure. <laughs> Yeah, that's 11 kilohertz, I think, if I'm reading that right. And it is just failing. And it starts to fail about, at, in, to, in my book, it's, it's good up to here, and then it's losing it. So it's, it's making up to 7 kilohertz. I don't know if it's significant if that, that that's about the sample rate divided by pi. Uh, I've had other filters that worked up to sample rate over pi, so I don't know if that's if that's what this filter is going to do for us too. But at any rate, um, so so as long as you don't mind never going above seven kilohertz, your uh, one your once oversampled thing is going to be okay. Eh, you know, no, not that's dirty. Anyway, it's it's here's where it really starts failing spectacularly. Anyway, somewhere in there. Okay, so now what we do, yeah, let's turn this down. Well, let's, let's try oversampling it by a factor of two. And now, Runga cut is fourth order, so the error should now go down by a factor of, I think, eight, either eight or 16, depending on which of the two ways I'm, should go down by a factor of 16, fourth order. So uh, a factor of 16 linearly is uh, 24 dB better. So every time you double it, you get 24 dB more of, of goodness. And now, I don't know what that is. It might be beating or it might be... Anyway, uh, let's turn this down. Now we're able to go cleanly up there. And here, now we're getting badness at about 19. You can hear something that sounds like fold over, but but is, can't be described as foldover really because this is not a sampled process, this is something else. But yeah, it, getting aliased frequencies, that is a thing that one can, can get in, in this kind of thing. So what really happened wasn't that the, it wasn't so much that the error went down by 24 decibels, but that the frequency that I was able to reach went up by a factor of two-ish. And in fact, it should be in general the case that uh, the maximum frequency I can get up to is is proportional to the amount that I oversample it. There's there's no there's no fourth order goodness there. You really have to actually upsample essentially linearly in, in how in how much more frequency you want to cover. So at this point, if I if I say I want oversampling of say three, then everything's going to be clean all the way up to the end of the audible range. Why? 
I think I think it's just this stuff. Except here I, I made it nice and periodic. And there, of course, the period isn't you know commensurate with the step size, and so it's making non-periodic stuff. But it's just that kind of thing. Can you remind me of what you're saying the limitations of trying to do this with sample-based methods were? Oh, right. Why couldn't you do this with sample-based? Um, you know, I haven't actually done it with sample-based. I've only read what other people say about it. And what they say about it is that the fact that there's a one sample delay in the feedback path means that the phase doesn't hit 180 degrees. Or rather, when the phase does hit 180 degrees, then you have to add one more sample of delay. And so it messes up the frequency at which the thing resonates. But then it, uh, but then it turns out that that leads to subsidiary errors too, because then it, when you plot the curve, I mean, Stanford's done this. If you, when when you, then you plot the curve, you discover that the curve doesn't track very well. The curve meaning the frequency response right. curve. But the thing that um, the thing that I would be more suspicious about is if you were taking this thing and modulating the frequency very quickly, it, um, the sampled result probably would be messed up because everybody would be out of time, out of sync with everybody else. And here, um, I believe I can actually do FM with this thing and make it work. In other words, I could put a I could put a like a 440 hertz oscillator on in this cutoff frequency and it'll actually do that correctly. I think we should find out. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do now to try that is I'm going to turn this off so that we're just going to oscillate. Oh, why aren't we oscillating today? Huh. Oh, we are oscillating. I just, it's just got a lot quieter. Oh, yeah, I didn't do the... I should, uh, I should do this. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, sorry, so what am I doing? I am now going to take this thing, which is the resonant or cutoff frequency, and add a sinusoid to it. Hmm. Oh, I've got my volume knob problem again. So now what I'm going to do is to make an oscillator. Oh, I've got an oscillator. Yeah, I'll take, make another one. Yeah, let's do 220. And then I'm going to just be sloppy and multiply it by a number like this and add it into this thing. Oops, add it in here. So we're at 75, and now we start doing this. And we're getting decently clean sounding FM. And that, I bet, is something you can't do with your Moog. <laughs> Although I've never tried it. <laughs> Maybe you can. <laughs> okay, now what I'm going to do is. Since I just actually made an improvement on this, maybe I should uh, put this back so that... Yep. All right. Okay. So that is um, the Moog filter uh, in Run Runga Kutta simulation. Uh, now... By the way, the resonance also can change at audio frequencies, so there's probably a fair amount of messing around you can do with this thing to see what you can do. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, so uh, next example of something cool that you can do is the, is the Lorentz attractor. And the Lorentz attractor looks like this. Um, let's see where we are. Lorentz.c. Here's the Lorentz attractor. Um, the way you find out about stuff like this is you just go look on Wikipedia. 
Um, and in fact, I copied these equations down from Wikipedia without making it making exactly one change, which is uh, which is that I fixed it so that I can time scale everything. So my so my part of these equations is that so he, so these are the derivatives which we compute in the derivative computation function, and uh, I introduced a parameter which I'm calling alpha which I just multiply all the derivatives by. And what that does is you can take any differential equation in the world and you can just scale the derivatives and all that does is that makes the thing work faster or slower in time. So you get away just of speeding the whole thing up or slowing it down. So any kind of differential equation you've got, if you like it and like what it does but wish it would just operate on a different time scale, just put a, put a fudge factor in which is just scaling all the derivatives and that just changes time. Speeds time up or slows it down. Uh, and then this stuff is just what Wikipedia says it is. And I won't bore you by finding out what Wikipedia says. Oh, but I should show you the picture. Here, here's why the Lorentz attractor is interesting. For this, I'm sorry, I hate it when... Uh, I hate it when people use the web for lectures, but this is what's going to happen. Need the pick. Oh, forget it. Uh, yeah, it's it's a picture worth getting, so I'm gonna get it anyway. Sorry, this is this is set up I should have thought of before. But it's wonderful that if you want to know something, you just connect a cable. Maybe you guys think that that's kind of obvious, but it was not true when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, come on. Ah, why won't you do this? Huh, there, it's doing it. Ta-da! Lawrence says to, okay, there's a picture here I want you to see. There! <laughs> this is, um, can, can I do this? Oh, I can't find my plus key. Here we go. This is the... Th Sorry about the animation. This is just Wikipedia being annoying. But, uh, <clears throat> but what's going on here is there are three... Um, this is a three-dimensional thing, and they're, they're now showing you X against Y, but you can see it in several different ways. But the, the basic deal is it has two uh, stable points, and then it has a spot here or an area here which is in the orbits of both stable points and depending on just where you land on that thing you will end up getting attracted to one or the other of the orbit points but then it then it promptly spits you back out so that you have to then make a decision again about which one you go to all right and this is um, this came out of I, th this came out of I think some kind of analysis of some kind of weather system but at any rate the cool thing is that um, you get these um, Things that are orderly, because the shape is just what the shape is, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a recognizable shape. But on the other hand, if you look at what's coming out of it, it's unpredictable. It's, it just, it's like the weather, basically. And this is a good, this is a good um, what's the right word? People use this to explain why it's futile to try to predict the weather. Because um, if you took where this thing is, you know, I don't know how to stop this animation. Uh, anyway. If you just look at where the thing is, but then move it to some very nearby place, just move it one, you know, 10 to the minus 10th, just one niche, just one epsilon, then the, um, at some point in the decently near future, like 10 steps from now, the thing will be in some radically different place from where it would have been otherwise. So even though it's always moving continuously, a very small change in where it is at one moment will become a very large change in where it is uh, after a couple of times around the loop. Um, okay. Um, that's kind of all I have to say in order to give you an idea of what the Lorentz attractor is. Oh, right. One other thing. Um, your physical intuition is wrong. There, uh, the point that's moving around is not a physical point that has momentum. Instead, what's going on is this is a velocity field. 
So it's, it's like the differential equations that I was showing you earlier, where where the point goes depends only on where it is, but not on how fast it's moving. Uh, to put it technically, it's a fir first order set of differential equations. Right, so, uh, and, sorry, another thing I forgot to say, which is kind of interesting and important. Um, if you're if you're restricted to two dimensions, you can't do this. Because in two dimensions, you can flow in a circle, but you can't make a knot because the thing can't cross itself because where it is determines where it's going to be next. So there's no way that you can have two paths that cross because the place where it crosses, would it would have to have gone one place or the other because that's what the equation would have said. So you can't actually get this kind of, of unpredictable behavior in a two-dimensional system. It just can't be done um, because there's no way to do it without having paths cross each other. If, and if paths don't cross each other, then there's no way you can make it unpredictable. You can make it spiral, but you can't make it do this kind of thing. So three dimensions is, a, is an absolute minimum for this kind of behavior. Um, we've seen two, well, no, we've only seen one three-dimensional situation so far, which was our two coupled oscillators. So when we took two coupled oscillators, each of which had two degrees of freedom, but then we insisted that the total, um, total energy was constant, which is to say that the sum of the squares of the four numbers would be constant. It was a four-dimensional surface, but the fact that we introduced that equation put us on a three-dimensional subsurface of the four-dimensional equation. So two, two coupled oscillators, if you, if you store, well, two coupled oscillators, if each one of them stores two elements, um, even if you fix the energy, hold the energy fixed, it's a three-dimensional space in which you can have chaotic behavior like this. And in fact, we were able to get chaotic behavior from it. So, um, so this is going to be this, this, this is not going to be the first chaotic thing that we've seen. All right, uh, now let's get this thing shut up because it's really annoying. And let's go over here. Um, now, why these equations do that, I have just simply not spent the time studying. And um, I also don't know whether it's obvious looking at these equations, whether that beautiful uh, two-winged symmetry exists or not. That symmetry means, or should mean, from the way I look at it, that you could negate two of the variables but leave the other variable fixed, and it would leave this thing invariant, but I haven't checked that. So there's a lot of analysis one could do with this without having to use a computer. But using a computer, we can just forget analysis and just brute force um, um, imitate the thing, or s solve is the wrong word, um, simulate the thing. <coughs> and we do it like this, PD uh, example Lawrence. Ooh, and I misspelled Lawrence. Pronounce the T, but you don't spell it. Right. Oh, and it hates me because why did I ask you? two things? Oh, right, and then I renamed it mode filter. All right, this worked before, so it must not have worked because I. All right, Lawrence. Oh, this is a Macintosh version of Lawrence, but I need the Lawrence Linux 64. Got it. And now um, there are three. Um, what's the right word? There are three state variables. That's to say, the, the thing moves in three dimensions. And there are four parameters. And that's just because the Lorentz attractor comes with three fudge factors that you give it, and then I gave it a fourth, which is the overall speed, which which is a time scaler. And that's probably the only. <laughs> well, that's the only one I've messed with, actually. Uh, okay, so let's see what it does. Um, something bothers me about. Oh, right. Sorry, what is going on here? Um, I think. Okay, <laughs> I have fixed this since here because here's the thing. These are. This is all wrong. This is the Moog filter uh, uh, test patch, and I want another patch. So let me see if I've actually just got the wrong file name. I've got Lawrence, t oh look, I've got two things called Lawrence. Ah, and this is the one that actually knows that it's Lawrence. Okay, so let me just do some hygiene here and uh, remove the bad one. 
So the bad one is this example bar. It's Whoa. Oh, come on. All right. I <laughs> can't have it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now we're now we're here. Okay, Lawrence attractor. So the outputs are uh, whatever x, y, and z are in that picture that I got rid of too fast. And the inputs are my speed parameter, which is alpha, which um, should be in units of uh, one over time, which is units of frequency. Now, why did I modify this? Okay. And so I just uh, uh, so I just made it gave it a pitch because it needs a frequency and actually it needs a frequency probably in radians per well who knows anyway something on that order. And then these parameters I just looked in the cookbook and it said that th these are the three parameters that made that wonderful picture that you saw. And apparently, other choices of these parameters are sometimes chaotic and sometimes not. And sometimes it just sort of happily settles in on a stable point, which won't make any sound. So actually, probably this it's not even interesting to change these. Right? And if I remember right, I think 28 is the important number. Uh, yeah. I think that's the most significant one in the terminal. That could easily be. Uh, we can find out. Uh, or at least we can find out which numbers, which one sounds best, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, now, uh, yeah, there. interesting. Oh, right. Um, there's a thing I did, which was on load bang, I set the thing to be non-zero because it turns out that these equations, if all, if the state is all zero, then we get zero derivatives and it gets stuck right at the origin. So the uh, you have to give it a bump before uh, before it'll take off, which has frequently been true. And then um, yeah, so let's see what we're listening to. We're getting a lot of juice. Like this is the this is the level that's coming out, and it sounds like this. It sounds like nothing. What am I doing wrong? Any other sound like anything? No. Oh well, what do we have? We have, uh, those are nice audible numbers, aren't they? So, oh, did I turn the, let me see if I've got audio going at all. No. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's me. I think I turned my speaker off trying to get the thing to quit giving me events. Oh yeah, now I think maybe I have to go get also mixer. That's good. What am I doing wrong? I have the mixer turned down but not off. Okay, so this thing might be doing something bad to me, but all right, let's close this. Oh, you know what? Do we have another PD open? Oh, look, yeah, we have another PD open somewhere. Where? Oh, here. Okay. Try this trick again. Here it is. All right, so the Lawrence attractor, as I recall, so this is, I, I did this a week ago, so I'm, so I'm operating on memory now, but here's, um, here's one of the dimensions. Here's another one, and here's the third. <laughs> now, how you see that in that picture, I think what you do is the following. The, the, the thing is kind of butterf is a butterfly with two wings, and if you look at the, if you look at the parameter which is which of the two wings it's on, I think that's Z, and therefore I think that's why you hear some kind of structure there. I'm disbelieving my own voice as I'm saying this. Anyway, there you can sort of hear this. The, I guess what you were hearing really is the thing whirling around here, and, and you only hear that in one of the three dimensions. That I actually I can't explain that at all. 
and true to form, uh, what you get, or correctly enough, what you get is time scalable. So this is actually quite a satisfying noise generator. Although actually you could probably get something that sounded pretty similar just by using the Moog filter. But this, and noise as input, this one though, That's a nice fuzzed out oscillator. I think that's interesting. You can actually ascribe a pitch to this pretty well. Um, so that's, uh, all right. So now what I have to do is change the value of 28. <laughs> I think I'm gonna do this really carefully. <laughs> louder and higher. Oh, and then it dies. <laughs> All right. So there we have it. Um, the other thing that I found useful to do was uh, just to use this to drive an oscillator, especially if you make it a little slower, then you can do this. So what this is doing, this is actually the path. It seems to get thrown out further. At, when, it, when it starts a loop, sometimes it gets thrown out further than other times, and that's, that's changing the pitch of the oscillator. So all, the, all that's happening here is that uh, instead of just listening to the output as an audio signal, I'm scaling it and then playing it using an oscillator. So this is the sort of thing someone would use if they were trying to scientifically explain the, not explain, but sonify the, uh, the, the process. Because you can almost believe you hear structure in this. So anyway, this is up on the web if you want to download it. Although I, I, <laughs> Lawrence dot, Lawrence .so exists, and you'll have to use that to use it on a Macintosh. But what I forgot to do was compile Runga Kutta itself for Mac. Uh, the thing that's going on here is Runga Kutta is a piece of C code that, or is, an, is a shared library that PD loads in order to, to be able to use this object. But it in turn, this is not usual for PD objects, it in turn loads another shared object which you name to it. So this is a essentially a, a, ne a too deep nested extern structure that I've made here to make this work. Could you theoretically make a version of Runga Kutta that takes experts and takes expressions? Expressions. In order to be able to do this manipulated in real time, or not in real time, but in the PD context. Well, actually, what I would do before I did that is I would just give the thing a reload method and just tell you to change the C code and reload it. Mm -hmm. And I thought about doing that, but then I didn't feel sure that anyone would ever care enough to want to do that, so, <laughs> so I didn't. Um, but I think that would be a more correct thing to do. Because after all, why not? I mean, compiling this thing takes like a tenth of a second. And here I never actually found a situation where it seemed to matter whether you oversampled or not. But that's perhaps because I didn't really want to listen to noise operating at the Nyquist frequency anyways. I don't know. All right. So uh, let's take a break now and then what will happen after I come back is, unless you have questions about this, I will move immediately on to the, the first thing that I have to do is develop some background, which is how to do graphics in PD. Um, the, this has an interesting history. The, um, P, the PD graphics system actually was done by a graduate student in the computer music program, the very first one whose name was Mark Danks, who's now probably a millionaire. He's, um, uh, he's one of the principals of, of uh, EA, Electronic Arts, blah, blah. So 
Uh, so you can make great, you can make a lot of money in computer music if you just decide you're doing computer games instead. Um, and a um, very smart and capable guy who, before he even got into the computer games world, um, decided that he was interested in, in making uh, performances essentially that, were, that involved audio and, and graphics. And the, uh, the graphics, whatever you call it, the, the graphics package du jour at the time was uh, called GL, or what soon, soon became OpenGL. And Jim, as, as it now stands, is essentially what graphics looked like in 1998 or 99, back when, uh, back when Jim was created. The good news is that uh, OpenGL it has been compatibly maintained since then, or at least compatibly enough that, that the few changes that have been made have, have actually been made in, in Jim correspondingly. Uh, so that you can run Jim perfectly well now and probably will be able to on, on laptop hardware anyway uh, into the foreseeable future. The bad news is that um, there, a lot of the stuff that is in Jim is actually the obsolete part of OpenGL. So it's the part of OpenGL that's being called legacy and is being hauled around forever because there's stuff that uses it, but, uh, but it isn't likely to be um, ever implemented on your cell phone or on your uh, Raspberry Pi or, or new architectures like that. So um, for practical purposes, this only runs on, on PCs. Well, PCs and Macintoshes and Linux boxes. So things that existed in 1997. Um, the and I'll try to give you a, uh, an explanation of what aspects of this are, are obsolete and what as and why. And um, if anyone wants to think about making a thing that would replace Jim and use the up-to-date aspects of OpenGL, uh, that would be a really good project. And I've spent a little bit of time thinking about that, but not enough to actually set about doing anything. Jim is actively maintained, though. Um, it's maintained by Hannes Smulnig in Graz, and it's part of PD Extended, and or you can just download it from Zmilnig, I guess from the um, IEM website in Graz, and that's what I've done. I just download it into Linux and compile it myself, which is what I find easiest to do. But what you will find easiest to do, perhaps, is just download PD Extended and steal Gem from out of it, which, by the way, you can do with all the libraries there. You can just take all the libraries out and use them in PD instead. So you can actually have all of PD Extended um, anytime you want. Uh, it just came up today that people don't seem to realize, or Tom Herb didn't even realize, that uh, PD Extended seems not to be maintained anymore and probably never will be again. Uh, it's frozen in version 43, which is about two and a half years old now, I think. And so it's becoming less and less tenable to actually use PD Extended. But still, you can download it and steal all those libraries and use them in PD, and that will, that'll, track <laughs> that'll track perfectly well with how PD is going in the future. Um, so, get, so get Jim one, one way or the other, and then um, what, um, what I do is I just type the word Jim. Hey, why did that happen? That was interesting. Anyway, Jim. Um, Jim is a library, and then it prints out all this uh, stuff about, uh, how, hi, I'm Jim, I just got loaded into PD. And what I've done is I've made myself an alias in pure data. Oh, I should just show, sorry, in, in, in the shell. Uh, can I see it? Yeah. So what, I, what you have to do is say PD and then minus lib and then whatever garbage, well, whatever the path is to Jim that you've loaded. And then I had to also, there's some abstractions and I have to add them to my path. So you have to do something like this and this, which um, GUI people, people who use GUI-based programs do by using the appropriate dialog box in pure data. Um, there's a, one for startup libraries and one for path. Once you've done that, you've got Jim running, theoretically. And then you should see Jim announce itself like this. Um, and then what you, do, what you get is this. So what I'm going to do for about a half hour is just show you the basics of Jim so that you can understand sort of the, the model by which Jim works. And then I'll spend a few minutes complaining about how obsolete it is. Um, so what we do is we get a new window. Uh, to, to, to speak very, very roughly, Jim... Jim is, tries to be like the tilde object set in PD in the sense of it tries to be a network of objects that operate among themselves except that they pass around images instead of uh, audio. But they don't really pass around images for the most part. Instead, they pass around 
stuff that later gets, uh, turns into a collection of instructions for the OpenGL subsystem. And there's more I have to say about that, but I can't explain it right now in this context. So, so it, it's not the case that everything that's going down the wires is actually the images, although every once in a while it actually is, depending on what's going on. Uh, and what you do, there's no such thing as a DAC, but what there is is a thing called the gem window. And the gem window, G-E-M-W-I-N, -G uh, takes commands to create a window and also, uh, importantly, to know what its size is. So D-I-M-E-N, bad choice of name. And I'm going to say, let's do 640 by 480. And then, um, just to make it easy, I'm going to say comma and then one. One turns it on and zero. Oh, no, I have to say create. D-I-M-E-N. What did I do? Oh, did I miss the I? Thank you. Yeah. Let's see how this does. Yeah, there it is. Um, no, no errors so far. We're happy. Uh, and uh, to, to get rid of it, uh, stop rendering and then destroy the window. And that's just, you know, just that's just how you do that. Um, there's other stuff here, and you can find out about it by getting help on Jim Wynn. Um, but this is all you really care about, I think. This is all I care about, I should say. Um, now, oh, except for one tiny thing, but we'll get there. Um, the next thing that you do is you make an object. And the way you make objects are you... Um, so Jim doesn't, um, it doesn't benefit from having PD infrastructure that helps it directly like the, the tilde objects do. So PD knows about the tilde objects just by being PD and having tilde objects. And so there's lots of stuff that... PD can do for you that Jim can't because PD doesn't just have Jim support built into it. So uh, what you do is you have to get something that um, you have to make an object that PD will um, be able to find and find your your network by, and that's called a Jim head. So you say Jim head, and then you um, and then everything that you oh, let's see if I can do this. And then everything that happens after that is, yeah, I guess it doesn't do much. Everything that, uh, Jim starts throwing weird messages out the Jim head that are not human readable, but which are interpreted by other Jim objects to help them figure out how they're connected to each other, basically. And the basic idea is you, ha you say Jim head, and then you have any number of modifiers that you want, and then you have a, an object that you want it to render. So a reasonable object might be a square. Well, that's actually a terribly unreasonable object because it doesn't have a whole lot of things that you can do with it. But, uh, but I'll just make a square. So what you do is you just connect it to the gem head, and then, dig, there's a square. Um, the stupid thing about the square is it doesn't actually give you ways to control uh, where it is. I think all you get is, is a control for the size, which is this entry here. So square, like that. OK. Um, this. You can't see it, but it's all happening in, in three dimensions. Uh, and But Z is zero at, at the moment, so everything is at the moment is flat on the screen. And then, if you want to tell it to do something with the square, um, things that you can do are, for instance, color RGB. Sorry, and there are strange names, but that's just what it is. And that will tell the square what color it should be. Uh, and again, kind of badness. Uh, this is red, green, blue, and alpha. And alpha we'll have to get into a little bit later, but alpha is the transparency of the thing. Here's the red value. And everything is from 0 to 1 now, so if I hit shift now, I can turn the red plane on and off. My nice square, right? So you're starting, starting to feel like this is powerful, or else you're starting to feel like this is just Mickey Mouse. All right. And now we're going to say rotate. I think you say rotate x, y, z. These, are, um, these two objects actually are abstractions, which, oh, no, they're not. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> they're actually, whatever I was about to say just is wrong. Okay. And rotate x, y, z, you give it a, um, you give it a, Essentially, a three vector, which I believe is in degrees. Yeah. 
And so now, right now I'm rotating by the z-axis. And these rotations are in, well, I don't know how to explain it, but this, th these three make a vector, and the, the vector's direction is the direction about which you rotate. So z is pointing straight out, out of the screen, so that if you rotate about z, it rotates in the xy plane. If I rotate about x, say, then it rotates in the y, z plane. And look at the um, perspective. That's obscene perspective. Um, the, uh, this, is, uh, this is, again, what Silicon Graphics thought was a good default um, back in 97 or something, maybe earlier than that. Uh, so this is viewed from a camera angle that is as if there were like a 20 centimeter lens, millimeter lens on the thing. So there's a, there's a thing going on here, which is that you have to choose the, how far the camera is from the scene that you're looking at and, and, and what the, what's the word for that, what the millimeterage of the lens was. What's the difference between wide? Sorry? It's not the focal length, because it's not the aperture. Aperture is about exposure, and focal length is about whether it's blurry or not. But there's a third thing, which is the length. Oh, it's the zoom. So the same, so the same piano, say, you could look at up, up real close zoomed out, or you can go way back and zoom in, and you get a different kind of piano, right? If you, if you, right, and a reasonable zoom is like 50 to 70 millimeters. I don't know what that unit is, but I think that unit is, well, never mind. Yeah, that unit is how long the lens has to be, but, the, but it actually has some geometrical meaning you can ascribe to it. But uh, here, it's as if it were a 20 millimeter, ex, you know, just obscenely wide angle lens. And there's some way that you can control that, but I've never found out what it was, and so and I've just sort of stayed away from <coughs> using reasonable values. I've just kept values of z very small so that the thing doesn't make perspective for me <laughs> that I don't want. Um, and there's some way to control that. Is there a camera object that the camera I uh, I sort of think there is, but I don't know how you use it. I think it's just like um, the thing is that it, it just puts it in X Y Z space and moves the camera around and it focuses on zero. Yeah, but is it, this is Jim you're talking about or OpenGL in general? OpenGL. Yeah. Okay. So OpenGL, I believe you can have as many camera objects as you want. And so it's just kind of an abstraction. And, then, uh, and what, it really, what it really amounts to is a four by four matrix, which is a transformation matrix, which takes three dimensional points and does the correct <coughs> projection to, to give you a, a thing you can put on a screen. And here, at least for, what am I saying? Here, there, there just is a world camera, if you like. There's just the camera, um, which is, obsolete because they because uh, it should be a thing that's more plastic than that and there and I think you you tell Jim Wynn something directly you just Jim Wynn is sort of the thing that does all the global deals with all the global messages about how the graphics setup is and I think it's going to have messages to set the uh, to set the camera whatever you call it matrix uh, but I have not actually looked into that the um, the thing I have to warn you about is this um, this whole thing about uh, I'm going to have a uh, a geometric object and to control where the geometric object is I'm going to apply these transformations to it. Um, that is obsolete. That is the aspect of, of Jim which um, is now completely replaced by uh, essentially just go down on the shader and do it yourself because it's turned out that the um, the sort of hyper literal way that this thing renders is too literal to actually even be useful for computer games, uh, much less for artistic purposes. And as a result, they have recently essentially de-emphasized this in favor of thinking in a more pixel-based way so that you just actually write pixel code down in the shader to make the actual stuff happen. Um, and that's, that's the sense in which this thing needs now to be rethought because um, actually when you get down into the shader, how much should I be telling you about all this? The shader is, uh, what a shader means is uh, code that you write that runs, I'm over, I'm oversimplifying, but code that you write that run that writes, sorry, that works per pixel in, in effect. And um, when you make shapes, uh, 
somebody down there is figuring out what pixels actually belong to the shape and what don't. And that's, uh, th those are vertex operations, which also happen down in the shader because there are things called vertex shaders. But then the interesting thing, as far as I understand it, or as far as I've been able to do it myself, is, uh, is, talk, is actually deliberately setting the colors of pixels in various ways, depending on, um, on what you're doing. Uh, so uh, an example of something that uh, you cannot do in OpenGL, but which I've had to do is, oh, I want to I want to just project onto a dome. Mm -hmm. Well, dome isn't planar. So in fact, the way you get three-dimensional space to become a pixel on, on the projector is not going to be a, a matrix projection. It's going to involve doing some arctangent stuff. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I had to get down in the shader to, to move all the pixels around to where they really wanted to be. And in fact, um, in fact, you, apparently in practice, enough people have discovered that basically 95% of the time you have to go outside of this model in some way or another to, to actually get to where you're trying to go, that, that in fact the, the computation all turns out to be you get getting down and telling the, the thing, oh, if this is the place that we want to be in XYZW space, here's a good pixel to put it at, and here's a good amount to color it by, and if the light's coming from this direction, make it bounce this way, and blah, 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 blah like that. You just code it up and say, hi, I'm a pixel, and I'm going to... Um, the light's coming from here and it's going that way and so there's the reflectivity blah 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 and then you write code the cool thing is that you can hijack that and you can use it to 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 uh, solve optimization problems and other kinds of, of big data stuff uh, so you can um, you can do number crunching by pretending that that uh, your different <laughs> that your 10,000 differential equations are actually pixels and then just ask the uh, uh, just ask the pixel shader to, to shade it in such a way as that it moves according to your differential mm -hmm. equations or whatever it is that you're trying to do, uh, as long as it as long as the thing that you're trying to do is fundamentally mathematical, as opposed to data gathering, um, then you can just do it in, in, in your graphics hardware. And furthermore, it runs the graphics hardware. If if what you're talking about is additions and multiplications of 32-bit numbers, uh, graphics hardware tends to run couple orders of magnitude faster than your hardware, than your CPU. So there's all this uh, computation power in there that is basically not being used most of the time for anything serious and is only there so that people can play computer games because that's the driver for this whole thing uh, commercially. Uh, and yet it's 90% uh, of the computing power in the world is basically sitting in people's laptops unused in, in their graphics processors. So somebody ought to be thinking about this and, and, uh, and using this in a, in a way that would benefit computer musicians in, in much more seriously than they're being benefited right now. And that is a thing which I just invite you to think about every few weeks as you, <laughs> as you go about your daily lives. Look, there's this thing in your computer. You should be burning a, burning a hole on, in your lap <laughs> because you should be thinking about how to, how to use this thing for something cool. Um, all right, so I better just stop talking about that because I could go on and on. <laughs> but uh, except to say that uh, it could be that uh, one way to think about that would be what would actually be a good design, a good modern design of a graphics um, system to add to PD uh, in the same way that Jim was added to PD nearly 20 years ago now uh, that would do things in, in a way that would uh, unleash the power of graphics hardware in, uh, in a much more serious way than it is right now. You know, if someone can figure out a good paradigm for doing that, um, it'll be cool, it'll be very cool, <laughs> and you'll have lots of friends. Okay. Um, all right, but, uh, so now we just sort of forget all about that and just, and just go back to thinking about uh, how, uh, how things go in 97, which is we start, we set a color, we set a rotation, we perhaps, um, uh, let's see, sorry, another thing is we can translate to do this because I want to have two of these and show you how they combine. So I think to do that I can say translate x, y, z. Yes, indeed, Lee. And now I'm going to get square like that and um, I guess I need, uh, need some color control here. R, G, B, alpha. And something's probably going to go wrong, but I'll eventually get this working. Ah, come on. Stop there. All right. So 
this now is stop. Okay, good. Now, um, now I'm going to make there be two of these. This is the fattest part. Now there should be two of these, and now if I take one of these and rotate them, oh, look at that. <laughs> All right, uh, this is one square sort of stuck in the middle of the other square, and this is showing you the kind of crude way that things uh, occlude each other. Uh, this, this other square is, uh, let's do something else. Woo, anyway, uh, sorry, what am I trying to do here? I'm just trying to make it clear that there are two squares and one of them is occluding the other and vice versa. Now what I'm gonna try to do is make one of them to change their transparency so you can see what effect that has because this will directly affect what we can do with video feedback. Wow, I'm sorry, I'm making very ugly color here. What am I doing? All right, I'll do that. Okay, so, uh, the, so the fourth element of color is transparency, or opacity, I should call it. And when I ask it to be opaque, I have to do another thing. And I have never understood this, but I have to tell it, uh, there's an object called alpha which turns alpha on and off because, because by default in 97, things were never transparent. <laughs> we never had any transparency. Let's see now what's gonna happen. Yes, we've got it. So now, uh, the the alpha channel, as it's called, that's to say the um, the alpha dimension of color, allows the thing to be not fully opaque. So then you can make this kind of effect. So now what's happening is the purple rectangle is is partly transparent, and only partly occludes the blue one. And similarly, the blue one can be made transparent, and then a very strange thing happens. When I make the blue one transparent. It doesn't show us the red one. It just shows us black. <laughs> and that is because, and what I'm telling you is opposite, right? So, so you should forget this after I've told you. But what's happening is one of these two, I believe it's the red one, is getting, um, is getting rendered first. Let me think which one it is. The blue one's getting rendered first because the, the red one is actually in front of the blue one. And what that means is that when I change the alpha of the red one, I can make it partly transparent and can allow the blue one to shine through it a little bit. But since the red one is in front of the blue one, if I make the blue one be transparent, it allows the thing behind it to shine through, which is black. So what is happening is the blue, um, there's an order. The, red one, the blue one is getting um, rendered first, and it is in front of a black background, and so when you make it transparent, black comes through. And then when you put the red one down, the, the blue one doesn't know that we're drawing something behind it because it's happening afterward. That's to say, if you want something to be transparent, you have to draw it after you've drawn the things that are behind it so that it can let the things behind it through. If you, if you draw it first, then it won't know what's going to be behind it, and so when it lets stuff through, it's the, it's the background instead. And this is horrifying. <laughs> um, and here's why it's horrifying, right? And the way you, um, the, you know, if you're drawing monsters or... or people in, in uniforms running around with guns and shit like that. Um, what, you, uh, what you do is you just never allow the polygons to go through each other so that this never happens. And further, you never even draw the polygons that are included by other polygons. So, you, so in fact, if, if there's someone in a monkey suit in front of you, this half of the person is drawn and the other half of the person, which would logically be there, isn't even drawn because if it did get drawn, it might shine through and, and embarrass us. So, uh, so we just don't do that, right? So, so as, long as, you, um, as long as you obey certain rules, you can get this to, to render uh, believable, you know, partly realistic scenes. 
but when you're doing things like I'm doing here, then you can just get yourself confused and, and miserable. And that's just kind of the way it is. Sorry? I, um, I believe something terrible happens when you run it from the same gem head, which you might like, but which you might not like, which is this. Um, I believe in that case, one of these rotations, yeah, grabs them both, <laughs> but the other rotation only grabs the one that. So in other words, what happens here is gem head, color, rotate, draw a square, back up, color, <laughs> and rotate again. And so this color overwrites the other color, but this rotation composes with the other rotation. So you just don't do it. <laughs> Although, if you've, d if you've done with all your, and, and translation similarly, this, this is translating both of them, but this is only translating one of them. And notice that the translation is, has been is in the frame of reference that we rotated to over here, <laughs> and you will just yeah, it'll just keep you miserable. Uh, but sorry, the opacity. Did the blue start working? Mm -hmm. But uh, in that case, I bet the other opacity stopped working. Yeah, so now the now the we just we just switched one problem to another. Is there any way to control the camera? I think there is, but I don't know it. Oh okay. Alright. Yeah, and anyway yeah. Ugh. Anyway the, the the thing is why did they do this? The reason they did this in, in GL was that they thought that the way to get the, uh, the monster to move its arm was to make this, you know, make the elbow move the whole mess, sorry, make the shoulder move the whole mess, but make the elbow only move the forearm, but make the thumb joint only move the thumb and so on. So there was this hierarchical way of thinking about things. And the problem is that then when you animate like that, the object's torso stays fixed and everything else does this, but it doesn't, but you don't, but it doesn't move organically. You know, really, if you, you know, if you, if you move your arms forward, your center of mass being what it is, the rest of you moves back. So it's never the case that, you, that your torso is absolutely motionless while your arms are flailing around. But, so if you go looking at, at 90s uh, computer games, the torsos are motionless and the arms are flailing around. And that's because uh, that it's all being put together with this sort of hierarchical structure of, of, of transformations that control how things are. So, um, so you should basically just forget all the stuff exists, except that you have to use it in order to, uh, to do things. So the, the way I've discovered that you can actually use Jim without having to use all the transformations, I'm going to save this as... Uh, uh, I actually made a thing called Jim Intro, which uh, is less introductory than this. This is totally... Oh, let me, um, let me not do this, because... <laughs> That really will just give you vertigo or something. Okay. All right, so I'm going to close this. Moving dangerously here. And I'm going to open Jim Intro. Ta-da. And, uh, what? oh, yeah, right. So what I've done is I've made a nice little scene with two triangles in it. <laughs> uh, let, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's probably going to be a reason for this. Um, so what I've, uh, what I've done is made an object called random triangle. And this is just to show you what I had to do to make this reasonable. Uh, let's see. Alt. Uh, here's, a, here's a prim try object. This, this is an object which you can actually feed all the coordinates and colors to in such a way that you don't have to use rotations and other nonsense like that to get the thing to do what, it's, uh, what you want it to do. So that rather than think in terms of transformations, you can actually just sort of fix a three-dimensional geometry and just put things in it, like we should have done in the first place. And what I uh, so prim try has uh, three, sorry, six inlets, which you you can make these things vary in, in you know continuously, like you know you can animate them. But in in this case, I'm just using load bang to just put things in random places. So the first three are are three coordinates in three-dimensional space. So each one of these is a triple. 
and then after that you give it three colors for the three vertices, which are quadruples. So what I've done is I've, um, just for, uh, for reasons that will, I hope, become clear later, assuming I get as far as I think I'm going to get, I made, I made it possible to update the alphas so that the triangles can go transparent or not, depending on what's happening. But I um, just fixed the other things so that they are all random, but uh, if I get tired of what happens to them, I can re-randomize them. And then, uh, yeah, and then every time I click re-randomize, they move around. So my purpose to making them small, my, the reason that I'm making them small is because I'm going to want to be showing video feedback. And the way one, uh, when you start doing feedback, you want, or you might want, the things that are creating the feedback to be small so that then you can, well, you'll see. It'll just be easier to follow what's going on if the thing that we're starting with is small. And then when we make it big, then it'll be cool, but it won't be as easy to understand what's happening. And then if you want a lot more stuff, you just add a whole bunch more random triangles, which I'll do at some point and make you a nice big triangle salad, and then we can go on from there. So um, so the, my reason for doing this is the following. Okay, so, so all that's happened here is basically what's happened before. With one tiny change, which is that uh, I did something technical, which is I said Jim had 10. My reason for saying 10 is this. And this is weird. Uh, I told you before that it mattered which order the two rectangles got, whatever, uh, got rendered in, because, yeah. So it, it, it's going to matter that I'm able to render a thing before these triangles and another thing after these triangles. And the gym head object takes a number which is how which is how far, it, it, which allows it to order the computations. It's not a time in milliseconds or anything like that. It's actually just an order. But, I, uh, but it will make all the things get rendered in an order which is compatible with the numbers that I give it. So I'm going to give it one that's lower than 10 that will happen before this, before the triangles get drawn, and then I'll have to give it another bigger than 10 to, to ask it to do after. And so here's the way you do video feedback. The first thing you do is you draw the previous frame somehow or other. Then you draw whatever you want to add to it, and then you snapshot the previous frame. So instead of, so the, our delay line is going to be snapshotting the entire frame. And so we need to read from the delay line, which is to render the snapshotted frame. Then we need to add whatever we're adding into it. And then possibly we, uh, right, possibly we need to add a gain and something like that. And we'll actually apply the gain when we read the, um, when we read the previous frame. And then we will, um, having drawn the previous frame and drawn all the new stuff, then we'll take a snapshot, which, is, which doesn't have a gain. You just take a snapshot of everything that's going on. And now, unfortunately, to do this, I have to go look at, oh, right. <laughs> I, I prepared a thing to do that because I can't do this in real time because I just can't remember the... Um, I can't remember all the junk that you have to do to do it. Uh, the basic deal is this. Uh, oh, first off, okay, so we have a gym head 5, that means beforehand, and then we have a gym head 25, which means afterward. And sorry. Uh, so what we're going to do is beforehand, we're going to draw the thing. So we're going to have a gym head that draws whatever we're going to draw. Now, what I'm going to do now is before I, I'm going to get this back later if I really want it, but I don't want it right now. Um, sorry, I'm thinking about how to do this. What I'm going to, uh, what I should do is I should save this by duplicating it and call this one one. And this I want not to be rendering. And this I want to not be rendering. I'm not sure if this is... Whoa! Did I just kill something? Yeah, okay. So why does this not do anything? <laughs> Alright, don't know what's going on there. Alright, okay, so what I'm going to do is get rid of some of the junk here so that we don't... so that I don't get any more confused than I already am.
Maybe I care about that, but maybe I don't. These are settings. Um, let's get those settings in there just for fun. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to get rid of this. <laughs> because I... Oh, but none of those things made it. What? Oh, right, those aren't... For some reason, I didn't throw them through the... What? All right, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it doesn't matter. All right. Uh, do I care about that? Yes, I care about that. Good. Okay. So here's uh, here is what I believe is going on here. Um, what what we do is um, all right. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to sh how to make this clear. Um, clear. So, clarity. The, ooh, let's get rid of this. Um, the, the pix underscore snap to text object. Okay, so first off, uh, I told you that when, uh, th this, this rectangle is like the square, except you can control the two dimensions separately. Um, and we now have a rotation and a translation, which are exactly the same thing as before. And actually, there's even a color, except all I'm doing is I'm giving it grays from one to zero. Um, all we're going to care about. And the, the other thing that is a part of the state in which it, or out of which it, it um, draws the rectangle. So it draws the rectangle and it's drawing the rectangle in a state. And the state has a rotation, a translation, a color, blah, blah, blah. And it has a current texture. The texture is, is for doing what's called texture mapping. And this is jargon, computer games jargon. What a texture map is really is it's a picture it's just an, an image, a rectangular image, that you're going to paint onto the rectangle when you draw it. So, so if it's a reptile, you just make a picture of a bunch of scales, and then you draw all the polygons that show the that, that amount to the geometry of the reptile, and then you you use the scales for the texture, and then it looks like the like the thing's covered with scales. It's very cheesy because it's two-dimensional, and um, you can actually see that it's not really correct. But then. You know, then you get down into your pixel level messings around and make that better, which we can't do in gym. Um, or anyway, we're not gonna. All right. Um, so what we're gonna do here is um, here. Here's the here's the chain of, of affairs that is going to lead us to doing this rectangle. Um, we're going to disconnect this. <laughs> no, gonna disconnect. What am I going to disconnect? Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this be controllable separately. All right. So th these toggles start and stop uh, rendering. So what's happening here is this gem head is the one that draws the rectangle. And the way it does it is it gem head. Now we make the current texture be the result of a snapshot. Never mind how we made the snapshot before. But actually there was a snapshot probably because at some point this was turned on. So this thing, when I turn it on, is going to snapshot these two stupid little triangles here, right? Now, um, when I turn this thing on, then it will, uh, it, it already has that snap snapshot now, so it will draw a rectangle that has that snapshot texture mapped onto it with this color, which is, by the way, white right now. But white means, white just means um, draw, the, draw the thing in its original color. And now what I'm going to try to do is get rid of the triangles. Didn't work. Oh, because this is working. Now get rid of this. No, it's not working. What's happening? Why did the triangles not go away when I told it triangle alpha was zero? All right, I don't know how to get the triangles to go away. Where I had this working before. Triangle alpha. Oh, triangle alpha. All right. Uh, no. I want my eye. So how did that ever work? Okay, let's try this again. Um, first off. Got triangles. Yep, and now alpha is one. Ooh, 
Ooh, they went away. Oh, right, because I have it going to 100. Okay, good. So now I can make my triangles go invisible by making them transparent. Okay, I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's a triangle there appearing and disappearing. Okay, now we're drawing nothing whatsoever, but we do have a snapshot in here because I took a snapshot, and so I believe if I turn this on, we will now see that snapshot somewhere. I don't see anything. Maybe. All right. Let's, um, could be because I'm putting it in a stupid place. All right. Let's go back here. Let's get something a little bit brighter. I'm not having good luck here. There we go. All right. Something that we'll actually really see. Also toward the beginning, toward the middle of the screen. Okay. Oh, would that be a good? Would that help? Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, try it. If, if everyone gets tired of being in the dark, then uh, then we can turn it back on. Oh, actually, oh, I think actually that's a, that's probably the good setting right there. Okay, so now I'm going to make it transparent, and now I'm going to. Oh wait, I'm sorry. First, I'm going to make it visible, and then I'm going to turn on the process that snapshots it. And actually, I'm going to turn this on too. Ah, okay. So I can actually see something happening because it looks like the edge of the rectangle that I'm showing actually is cutting off just a bit of that triangle. Okay, so now I'm going to quit taking the snapshot and I'm going to get rid of the triangle. And then I'm going to go back here and start this thing and see if we see anything. No. Uh, okay, the rectangle is big. Got translation going. Come on, show me something. All right, I believe. I'm oh, it's divided by a hundred. Ooh, yeah. So I need this all the way up, don't I? Like that. Okay, still don't see anything. Oh, what else do I have to do? Changes anything. Uh -huh. All right. Now the next question is: How much of this am I going to bother to do until or before I just give up and decide to go grab one that works? Let's see if let's see if this one that I believe worked works. Huh. See, it's giving me it's giving me something tantalizing here, but it's not actually. All right, now let's try the other thing, the, the window that I actually had working. Uh, okay, it's got all of these wonderful values in it. And I'm not getting feedback yet. Well, maybe this is just not gonna work. to take this in. Well, it might be that I've just killed this thing by trying to edit it down. In which case, well, let's just get some more triangles going. <laughs> well, really what I should do is put these in a, in a sub window somewhere. 
dig. Something's happening. Oh, I see. What's happening here is it's drawing a, it's drawing blackness, and it's drawing it on a plane that's cutting off parts of these triangles. Mm -hmm. So something is almost happening. It's just not doing the snapshot yet. So how do I make it do the snapshot? What's well, missing? It could be that, no, I've already tried that. All right. Well, sorry, I'm just going to move on to something that actually works, which is sad because I wanted to make a simpler example. Yeah, I'll go, if any of you is curious, I will go back and try to figure out why this didn't work later. Because eh, it's not worth it right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open something that actually did feedback for me last I tried it. see it, the beginnings of something. Oh, I see. It's just too dark. Yeah. Okay, something's happening. I just need to change. So, oh, I'm seeing stuff on my screen now. It's just too dark to do anything with there. Yeah, we're getting there. All right. This is... Yeah, yeah, yuck. Well, okay, so part of this is just the projector being not terribly good. Um, What's going on here is um, I'm drawing a onset. I'm drawing a, a drawing a thing which is made of a bunch of polygons, although you can't see the polygons. And the way they are being computed is is actually designed so that you could use audio signals in here. What's happening is there are tables which control the x, y, and width of a ribbon that's getting drawn in space. And I believe it's the case right now that the first, you know, the first bit of this table, like the first 100 points of this 200-point table, it's a 500-point table. The first 100 points of this 500-point table are, um, are, first off, the y values of the thing which is going up and down, and the x values which is causing the ribbon to wag back and forth, and then there's a width control which makes it fatter or skinnier. And, and all of those are functions so that I can make the thing wiggle around and make shapes. And then it's fun to do this kind of thing. But x is, x is too variable. Uh, oh, that's y, so x is here, it's too variable. Ah. Come on, let's get on the screen. Seems like I've got the X scale kind of too crazy right now. And now Y needs to vary more. All right, I gotta quit fooling with this and just be happy with what I got. All right, uh, ribbon stretch, ribbon X location. Uh, onset. Okay, and then what I can do is I can ask it to look at different parts of the table so that it'll do this kind of thing. All right, so this is a thing which now might be a good source for trying to feed back. Yeah, look at that. Okay, so um, now what's happening is we're getting a copy of the image which stops at this part of the screen and drawing it on top of the image at a different place. So that, uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to find my control so I can figure out how to make this do something different. So here's the feedback patch, and this one actually now works, I believe. Yeah. So, so what I can do is make another copy of the ribbon, which is which, whose position I can control just by controlling translate X, Y, Z. And the cool thing about that is, and this might be familiar to all of you, um, well, it just makes feedback. It makes a bunch of copies of the thing which 
you can see discreetly at some point, but which, if you make it not move a whole lot, suddenly turns into a sort of a um, sorry, word, turns into a kind of a blur. And now I need a little bit more color here. Oh, actually, uh, dropping alpha now makes the thing. Let's just make the thing have soft. Woo, those are hard edges. Soft edges, please. I need to change the colors to get you more color going. Give me some region of the table that has interesting colors. Color on set. Sorry, I don't have enough room really to be doing this. Well, all right, maybe that'll do it. Okay, so now what's happening is um, the ribbon's getting whatever shape the ribbon is in is now getting drawn at some, at some. What's the right word? At some different size and at some different uh, location. So the size is controlled by uh, by the by the size of the rectangle. And then the. And then where it gets. To, oh yeah, it's maybe clear if I make the size smaller. And then when you change where it then draws it, it gives you. Just drawing off to just drawing more and more copies of the thing until it goes off into a, a vanishing point. Right? And, it, and there's a vanishing point there until I make the thing be a, big enough for it not to vanish. And then if it's big enough not to vanish, then it does the opposite thing, which is it just grows to fill the screen. All right. And then um, the thing that, OK, then a thing that might make it more interesting is, although I'm, I'm not getting very good images right now, then you can drop alpha, and then when it draws on top of itself with some transparency, then you get much less distinct kinds of images that are just made out of feedback, basically. Oh, and you can also see the thing propagate because it's happening at the frame rate. And then, if you can get it to stay on the screen, which is a matter of getting a, good, a suitable size and, and location, sorry, size and, yeah, size and location, then you can start uh, having fun with rotation too. So rotation now does this kind of thing. Woohoo. Maybe I want to rotate a little bit less than that. Like rotate it one degree per frame. And now as I change the, uh, let's see, as, as I change, I don't want to change the tables, I want to change my, where in the tables I'm using. That'll change the geometry of the ribbons, and then I'll be getting this kind of stuff, oh, less alpha. Right. And this is sort of standard uh, 1970s uh, light show style feedback here. <laughs> right. Okay, so the so the things that are at play here are when it draws the new image on top of the old image, first off, where it draws in relation to the old image, that's to say, is it in the same place, is it, is it at the same size, and also um, how, how transparently you want to draw the new one on top of the old one. If you draw it on top of it opaquely, then you get very hard-edged kind of stuff that is maybe less interesting this. Well, I don't know, I don't know, my, this might actually be not less interesting depending on your purpose. Uh, how do I get it now to not be completely, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, this is, this is now a more geometrical kind of feedback where you can actually sort of see what's going on. Where's the original? I guess the original is right here. Oh, what we need is for the original to be moving. Okay, that we don't need. Oh, no, wait, that's the main patch. Ah, go away. Sorry, now, now I don't really have enough screen to be able to do everything I'm trying to do here. Now let's make the ribbon be thinner. Tables, oh, I was gonna try to get rid of this. Okay, what's the 
too fat for one thing. There. So I'm making skinny ribbons now. And then what I'm going to try to do is... Alright, I was going to now try to find the place where I had a little metronome changing the oh, colors. Mm -hmm. Alright, okay. Now if we do that and then start... Um, um, what, are, what am I saying? Start, uh, get it so that um, more of it shows up on the screen. What ends up happening is things... If you imagine the thing drawing more and more copies of it, eventually they, they fall off the screen. And so there's a trick to getting the thing to actually stay on the screen, which I've never really mastered. Except just... Right. Just doing this kind of thing. Whoops. Yeah, right. Oh, there we go. Now we're getting... Now we're getting the proper 70s light show shit. <laughs> So now what's happening is that the place where it draws onto is smaller than the original and has been placed in such a way that there's a fixed point. So that then it has to spiral into the fixed point. And since it's a rectangle and not square, it doesn't spiral in round, it spirals in oval. And that we control by changing the size of the rectangle. Uh, well, sort of, yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah, and it tends to make snail shapes. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out to be, it's very confusing when you do this, but if you draw a, se a second copy, what that does is basically squares every, oops, and the second copy is not in a well-chosen spot. Um, so maybe I'm not going to draw a second copy because it seems to be drawing opaquely on top of the first one. Oh, well doing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's just too confusing. It, basically, uh, the thing is uh, constantly rather confusing. But, oh, in fact, if I drew that with size zero, we should see what the beginning one was doing, right? So now, why don't we get anything from the second one? Yeah, whatever. I don't know what's going on there. So then, um, this is this is being set up in, in the most poss opaque possible way, so as to make the kind of a clearly understandable thing. But then, of course, if you make the ribbon be fuzzy and it give it a little bit less alpha, then you get this kind of thing, which is the same, but sort of I don't know what um, less uh, less pedantic. Mm -hmm. So that is, I'm trying to think, is there more I should show you about this? There's a lot more to it, but I'm not sure how to show it to you, so I better just not try. Except I, oh, I can start the geometry of the thing changing like this. Right now I've got a proper light show going. Or a screensaver, <laughs> <laughs> depending on how you want to think of it. In fact, I've seen a lot of, um, whatever you say, visual music that really amounts to screensavers. And <laughs> this is a very good way to make a screensaver. <laughs> Maybe that's not really what you wanted to do. Also, it's very, it's very hard to understand what change is going to have what effect and why it's having the effect it's having. Now I'm asking it to spiral out instead of in. Now what would be what would be worth thinking about now, but is not doable in the old gym, but it's doable in the in current GL. So if you're willing to program down at the GL level, you can do this. Um, no one said that you had to make the colors composite in such a way that the new image that you're painting paints on the old one in the sense of, well, what is, okay, so how does the painting work? The painting works in the following way. 
there's a number alpha. If alpha is zero, which is to say if the thing is transparent, you just, you just um, by painting onto the thing just means leaving it unchanged. If alpha is one, painting onto it means replacing it with a color that, that is the color of the paint that you're applying, right? And then if alpha is something between zero and one, what you do is you, is you do a weighted average of what the old color was with what the new color is, is to be. Um, and, that's a, and that's kind of a believable way that paint should perhaps work. If, well, not necessarily, because sometimes paint just makes things darker the more you paint on it, but if the paint is reflective, then that might be a way that it would work. But no one is saying that you couldn't do, for instance, XOR. <laughs> Or some crazy kind of wave shaping, or actually any any function of, of the of the background and the foreground pixel, if, if you can call it that. The background pixel is what you're painting onto, and the foreground is what you're painting right now. Uh, why should it? Why should the result just be a, a weighted average of those two? Why can't it be those two bit bit crushed in some way together, or something else, whatever it could be that you could think of, like the front one could control how uh, could control how far you change the color of the back one. Like you could just make it be a color wheel rotation or something like that. And then you would get a whole class of, of feedback algorithms like this that could have spectacular kinds of effects. Uh, the other thing is why is the geometry, why does the geometry have to just be a linear transformation like it is now? Right now it's just a rotation and translation, an affine transformation I should call it. Um, it could be, uh, it could be any nonlinear set of functions that you please. The only thing is that Jim doesn't know about it because it has the old model of what's going on. So this is really just a starting point that you could use as a basis for something that could take you a lot further than this if you want. Also, you can incorporate real images. You can have a camera and make that do stuff for you. So I will just dangle this as a collection of possibilities that you can think of doing stuff with. Yeah, but don't um, don't do performances where you have someone playing an instrument and have a nice screensaver playing behind them because <laughs> it it disrespects the people who are on the stage and it bores the audience both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, this is enough by a long shot for this quarter, and there's no assignment, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Your assignment is to go get, get inspired by some of this stuff and go fool with it later. <laughs> and of course, I'm always willing to talk to any, any and all of you over the next quarters as you do things. And you can use this kind of, uh, some of these ideas or not, as you prefer. And yeah, just keep in touch and tell me what you're doing with stuff. And give me feedback on these patches too, like if you can think of ways that I should be messing with them to do other cool stuff, I'm happy to comply. Or grab them and make them do cool stuff yourselves. And I can maybe tell you how to do that. Good. All right. Uh, okay, so the patch that didn't work, I'll see if I can make it work. And if I can, then I'll leave it up. But maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just give you this one instead. The only thing is, I don't know if you're going to be able to figure out how to make it work without asking me for help. Because <laughs> it's just such a mess.